What is going on everybody? James Hancock here. Just got out of seeing Solo, a Star Wars story, a movie that I should admit I was not necessarily looking forward to. I was kind of indifferent going into it, but it is a genuine pleasure to report that I actually really enjoyed it. In general, I feel like giant movie franchises should push forward, look to the future, not be wallowing in the past. And I worried this would be nothing but a nostalgia trip cashing in on people's memories of Star Wars greatness from the past. But in spite of all the things working against this movie, the fact that the directors were unceremoniously fired like halfway through the shoot, they had to bring in Ron Howard as a pinch hitter to finish the film. And this is by no means a perfect movie. For the first 20 minutes or so, I really found myself struggling to even get engaged. But then something magical started to happen where I started falling in love with the characters. And then I saw a cool heist. And then I started falling in love with more of the characters. And then I saw an even cooler heist. And it just kept building and growing and improving. And by the end of the movie, I was absolutely floored by what a great time I was having. I feel like this is back to basic Star Wars, a simple tale of high adventure with good characters, evil characters, and those in between that we can all grow to love and admire over the course of their journey. And if, like me, you found yourself kind of pulling away from Star Wars after seeing Last Jedi, a movie that I still regard as basically a cosmic joke put on this planet to annoy me, I have to say that Solo did an amazing job of bringing me back into the fold. This is not a home run, it's probably not a triple, but it's maybe a double. At a, at a bare minimum, Ron Howard hit a very strong single, and I don't want to carry this metaphor too much further because I suck at baseball and don't really know what I'm talking about. Ron Howard, he's a director who is 64 years old. I grew up watching a lot of the movies he directed early on, movies like Splash and Cocoon. Like a lot of people, I really enjoyed Apollo 13, and although I don't spend too much time revisiting the movie now, I did watch Willow so many times that I could basically recite the movie by memory. A movie whose star, Warwick Davis, does get a little screen time here in Solo, so that was cool to see. But over the last 15 or 20 years, I have found myself pulling away from Ron Howard's movies. They started to feel like generic, bland studio fare, and there's nothing wrong with that. He's made piles of money doing what he does. But Ron Howard would have been well into his 30s when Star Wars came out. He's definitely not one of those filmmakers who saw Star Wars as a kid and wanted to grow up to be a filmmaker. But in a really interesting way, he recaptured some of the ingredients that I really loved in the 1977 Star Wars, as well as Return of the Jedi. And the scenes that I'm referring to specifically are the smoke and shrouded scenes in the cantina and Mos Eisley as well as the smoke and shrouded scenes in Jabba's Palace and Return of the Jedi. I feel like those scenes are filled with smugglers and gangsters and gamblers and thieves, a lot of very unsavory characters. But it's a side of the Star Wars universe that, are, that far too rarely gets explored. A lot of the video games have explored that, and a lot of the comics have explored that. But the movies, so little bit surely, have kind of shied away from that. And I have to say, it was an absolute blast to see a movie where nearly every single character in the story lives in a moral gray area where you're not quite sure who you can trust, except for Chewbacca. We all love Chewbacca. So while I hate admitting that I was wrong, it appears as if all my predictions months back about Solo being a disastrous production or at best a meaningless diversion, but it's actually a lot of fun being wrong when the end result is a very enjoyable movie. And as bizarre as it might be to say this, I'm actually craving a sequel to this prequel. I don't know what you call a sequel to a prequel. I guess you could just call it Solo 2, but I'm not ready to say goodbye to these characters. So that's about all I can say without diving into some spoilers. So this is my first and only spoiler warning. So if you don't want any secrets or anything like that, bail out now. But let's talk about Solo. So in the end, what sold me on this movie was the cast of characters. A cast of characters that you don't want to get too attached to because much like in Rogue One, a lot of these characters aren't going to make it to the finish line. And looking back on the movie, while it does have some exciting heist scenes and some action, this is not one of those action movies where the thrills of the spectacle are, are enough to support the movie. It really boils down to the heart and soul of these characters. This is not even a groundbreaking visionary movie in any way. But by the end of this movie, I promise you will fall in love with the majority of these characters because the cast just absolutely knocks it out of the park. So I'd heard rumors about this droid called L3 played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, but I have to say she kind of steals the show in every scene in which she appears. She's this neurotic, charming droid who has a relationship with Lando that's kind of complicated. I mean, for I feel like Star Wars movies tend to be very chaste and almost asexual in a lot of ways. If you see somebody kiss in a Star Wars movie, it's like, whoa. But at the core of this movie, we have partners in crime from two totally different species who may or may not be sleeping together. And I love how L3 is the one who's kind of casually dismissive of her prospects with Lando, talking about how they might not be compatible. And seeing her basically like rise like a phoenix halfway through the movie and become this liberator of her people, it was an absolute thrill to watch. And also what I really loved about her was seeing how 
part of her final fate and the way she is merged with the Millennium Falcon gives us a really interesting reason as to why the Millennium Falcon is so fast because she has the most comprehensive map of the galaxy in her mind. And when she and the Millennium Falcon merge, it allows the Falcon to take advantage of certain shortcuts. Thandie Newton is not in this movie very much, but she's totally badass in this as Val. Val is the partner in crime of Beckett, who's played by Woody Harrelson. And Tandy Newton just seems to be on fire lately, Matt. I absolutely love her on the show Westworld. And while she's not given that much to do in this, there's something about the way she moves and the way she looks in action, and also how just how fiercely distrustful she is of everyone around her. However, the one person that she does love and trust is Woody Harrelson. Ultimately, she makes a gesture of sacrifice to save the rest of her crew, but of all the characters in this movie who didn't get enough screen time, I feel like she's the most obvious example. Chewbacca, he's a pop culture icon at this point. He's been around for over 40 years, but unlike in Last Jedi, where I felt like they gave him absolutely nothing to do, he's an essential ingredient of the story. And watching his developing bromance with Han Solo was just an absolute joy, because Han Solo does not come roaring out of the gate in this as Han Solo, because this movie is very much about watching the persona of Han Solo as we know it come into being, but a crucial part of that is seeing him in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon with Chewbacca. But it takes a long time to get there, but there's something about the first time we see them side by side in action and the music kicks in at precisely the right moment. If you don't feel chills all over, then something's wrong with you because the music was used very sparingly throughout this movie where for like the first half of the movie, I was like, are we actually gonna hear any Star Wars music? But when they finally do use it, it has maximum impact. At any rate, Chewbacca, we got a little bit of his origin. We got a lot more detail about his personality. So they finally figured out a way to put Chewbacca to use in one of these Star Wars movies. Paul Bettany's not in this movie very much, but he does play an interesting villain named Dryden Voss. I hope, I hope I'm saying that correctly. He's a bit of a generic mustache twirling villain. However, he's got a great look. He has all these scars going down his face. His eyes are kind of bloodshot and red. It almost made me suspect that he was getting like some, some dark side force lessons. But he's a key component of the story because the only person he loves and trusts, the person he's been grooming, Kira, played by Amelia Clark. While on the surface, she might appear just to be the love interest of Han Solo, she's so much more. She definitely is his partner in crime throughout much of the movie. But also, as much as this movie is an origin story about Han Solo, it's also an origin story about how Kira becomes one of the first cool female villains in Star Wars. Star Wars has an embarrassingly short list of cool female villains. In the movies, I can almost think of none off the top of my head. The cartoons have definitely employed them. The video games have definitely employed them. And I have to say, my favorite part of the movie by far was seeing Kira embrace a different path than Han Solo before the end of the movie, leading to a great surprise appearance by Darth Maul, a character I never expected to see in the live action movies ever again. And the fact that she's reporting to him is one of the main things that makes me want to see a solo tube. Darth Maul is one of the few parts of the prequels that I really love. I still say Darth Maul's lightsaber battle at the end of Phantom Menace is one of the best things in all of Star Wars, even if Phantom Menace overall is a really lousy movie. But because Star Wars has so few interesting, compelling female villains, I really hope they'll keep Amelia Clark around for a few more movies. So we got Woody Harrelson as Beckett. I mean, at this point, Woody Harrelson's like an American institution. I've been watching him on TV and in movies my entire life basically. I mean, I remember I was a kid watching him on Cheers back in the day and grew up watching movies like White Men Can't Jump. But he seems to be basically ageless and keeps doing great work. I loved him in True Detective. I really enjoyed him in Three Billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. And while initially I was a little bit worried about him in this movie because he seemed to be almost kind of sleepwalking through some of his early lines, and it seemed like they're trying too hard to give him a personality by showing him do these fancy tricks with his blasters in battle. But by the end of the movie, he's one of those rare beasts in Star Wars, a person that you really don't know what to think about him because on one hand, he's an incredibly likable person and in many ways, he's a mentor and a teacher to Han Solo. However, he's also completely untrustworthy and a backstabbing son of a bitch. And seeing his final confrontation with Han Solo at the end was incredible because it wasn't some stupid drawn out fist fight rolling around. It wasn't a long drawn out gunfight. It finally proved once and for all that Han Solo does in fact shoot first. Now this character wasn't in the movie nearly as much as I was expecting him to be, but Donald Glover, He's one hell of a Lando. Billy D. Williams was the king of cool in the original Star Wars movies. And I got a huge geeky thrill by seeing Lando's badass armor from Jabba's palace make an appearance in this movie. But I was a little cautious about whether or not Donald Glover would be able to fill those shoes. Let's face it, Star Wars is a little bit dorky. Billy D. Williams, he was just smooth as silk and such a charmer in Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. But Donald Glover just seems to have effortlessly slid into the role. I imagine at this point in his career, Donald Glover has to wake up every day and just wonder, is this really happening all to me? Because he's got hit shows, hit songs, hit movies. His career is definitely hit a sweet spot. I love his gambling scenes with Han Solo. I love the fact that he's a cheater. I love the fact that he's got a million capes. This is a guy who definitely likes to look good. And from the way he reacts to L3's demise, 
I think he's been having sex with her. And there's a great little bit where he keeps calling Han Han, much like how Billy Dee Williams did back in the original movies, and Han keeps correcting him. But it's just one of those things that ties all these movies together. I was actually expecting this movie to be more of a buddy film between Han and Lando as opposed to Han and Chewie. Because for most of this movie, Han and Lando, they're basically like, they're, they're very watchful and cautious around one another. They're much more like competitors with similar goals as opposed to best buds. But this movie definitely filled in a key missing chapter in their history. But I would love to see these two actors back on screen together again. But last but not least, Alden Ehrenreich, an actor who I really enjoyed in movies like Hail Caesar. He's obviously got enormous talent, but asking somebody to play Han Solo that's a big task. I mean, for my generation, Harrison Ford is basically our Humphrey Bogart. When I was a kid, it was Indiana Jones and Han Solo and all these incredible movies. And I kind of pitied the poor guy going into this, knowing that people were just going to rip him to pieces. But I think he's going to be able to look back on this movie with pride. Does he have the same swagger as Harrison Ford back in 1977? No, it's a little different. But I like how he feels and looks like Han Solo, but he's doing his own thing with it. He's not trying to do a facsimile of Harrison Ford. He's doing the Alden Ehrenreich Han Solo. So I wouldn't necessarily say he was the strongest component of the movie. Never in any way, shape, or form did I feel like he was holding the movie back. I feel like he did a really solid, admirable job. So in terms of plot and lore, there was some fun stuff to sink our teeth into. We basically see the earliest beginnings of the rebellion and how Han indirectly plays a role in giving them some of their earliest supplies. We finally get to see what the hell the Kessel Run is, and that was a lot of fun. I feel like the movie almost ventures into Guardians of the Galaxy territory at that point with like giant Lovecraftian space monsters and things like that. But it was pretty cool overall. And it's fun hearing people talk about Jabba the Hutt. They don't even mention him by name, but how there's this gangster in Tatooine who's assembling people to work for him. But in the end, what I showed up for, I got. I got to see Han Solo piling into the Millennium Falcon through a variety of obstacles, hearing the music that I know and love from Empire Strikes Back. One of my all-time favorite scenes from any Star Wars movie is when Han Solo is going through the asteroid belt in Empire Strikes Back and all these TIE fighters are chasing him, but we're getting this killer music as all these asteroids are going through them. Also, speaking of TIE fighters, there's probably the most intimidating, imposing image of a Star Destroyer ever in any Star Wars movie as they're trying to use the shortcut through the Kessel Run and they see just this giant blockade by the Empire stopping their way out. It was a really cool moment. So once again, I do not like origin stories. This is not a movie that I was looking forward to, but I was very happy to be proven wrong on basically every front. Could the movie get started a little faster? Absolutely. Does the action feel rushed at times? Absolutely. But this movie managed that rare feat of introducing new characters to Star Wars canon that I really like, and also deepening my love for existing characters. Which is a giant relief because I don't want to be one of those bitter old men who talks about how much they hate Star Wars. <laughs> I'm probably not going to reverse myself a Last Jedi anytime soon, but I'm genuinely, sincerely looking forward to what J.J. Abrams is going to do with Episode Nine. Hopefully we'll be seeing some teasers or some news about that in the months to come. At any rate, I'm going to wrap this video up. I hope you enjoyed my reaction and review. Please consider giving my channel a subscribe. Definitely let me know in the comments below what you think of this latest Star Wars outing. And if you want to talk more, you can hunt me down on Twitter at Colbrex and tell me all the reasons why I'm wrong about Less Jedi. But thank you so much for watching my video. I really appreciate it. And as always, onwards and upwards.